The Missing Link surfaces at last. New video of Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum, connecting the dots between revolution in the Catholic Church 60 years ago and the Great Reset. Why did they get rid of Pope Benedict and install Jose Mario Bergoglio to the chair of St. Peter? And what's the connection between the global lockdowns of today and a bizarre middle-of-the-night ceremony that took place some 55 years ago, deep in the catacombs beneath the streets of Rome. The plot thickens tonight from the editor's desk. Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Michael Matt coming to you once again from the offices of the Remnant newspaper. Welcome, whether you're joining us on remnant-tv.com, which is off to the races, by the way, doing great. Thank you so much for spreading the word about that. Or if you're still with us from YouTube, that's great. Rumble, we're new on Rumble, but we're, we're getting started there. Spotify, whatever. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Tonight, we have an interesting show. Pretty stunning video, actually, uh, later on in the show of none other than... Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum, the ultimate lunatic of Davos, personally connecting all the dots between the revolution in the Catholic Church 60 years ago and the Great Reset, incredibly. I almost can't believe it myself after months sitting here week after week contending that the first Great Reset took place 60 years ago in the Catholic Church in something called the Second Vatican Council. And now along comes Klaus Schwab confirming our contention that that is exactly the case. Hi everybody, I'm Tess Mullins at Remnant TV. As YouTube continues to crack down on us, we need your help and it's so easy. Click the link below to get on Michael Matt's e-blast list so we can tell you when we post a new video. Also, donate at the link below to help us build up our alternative to big tech, remnant-tv.com. And if nothing else, get one of these t-shirts and help us spread the word. Remnant TV is a team effort and we can't do it without you. And I always use the example of Hollywood, the movie industry, which had really had to, had to bend to the pressure brought by the Catholic Church every time. That's where the Legion of Decency came from. If the Pope, back in the day, didn't approve of your movie out in Hollywood, your movie was an overnight box office flop. That was the influence of the Catholic Church 50, 60, 70 years ago. That was the influence they had to get out of the way if they were ever going to get to where we find ourselves today, facing a great reset, facing some sort of new order in the world. Today, far from standing against the bad guys, Hollywood or anywhere else, uh, you can see this, even if you're not a Catholic. Pope Francis, what's he doing? Does <laughs> he strike you as a spiritual leader? He's out there meeting with Bono. You know, he had Katy Perry come to the come to the Vatican to give speeches. Katy, I kissed a girl, Perry. I don't know if she's still a thing or not, but it was a scandal when that happened a couple of years ago. He's freaking out over things like air conditioning use in the world, you know, because of the polar bears and the ice caps. There's more, much more about that. Than he does about abortion and things like that, evidently, which he hardly ever even mentions. He's cooperating with the Chinese Communist Party, with the UN, with Davos, now with the Biden administration, right? I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not ridiculing the man. That's exactly what he does day in and day out. That's what Francis is. That's who, what, who Francis is. And if you'll remember how COVID really got off the ground. You remember this? Francis standing alone, we'll throw some of that video up on the screen. Francis in white, the solitary figure, standing alone in the Piazza San Pietro, the most recognized religious leader in the world, humbly complying with the global lockdown. It was in full force. And now, today, ever since, what's Francis been doing? He's been running PR for the globalists. Who's standing in the way right now of the religious exemption from forced vaccinations? Well, Francis is. Everybody knows where he stands on this. Who let old people die in nursing homes without access to their priests and without access to the last rites, to, to Viaticum, to their last confession? Who was that? Francis. Not a word from Francis. As we're told, tens of thousands of elderly passed away without their priests. Francis wasn't worried about that. He has to show that the largest and the oldest Christian community church is on the side of the globalists and that's because the largest oldest christian church the catholic church in her human element has been totally infiltrated you know this everybody knows this who's awake (laughs) 
And obviously, this was a long time in coming. Revolution, as we've talked about on the show so many times over the years, revolution raged all throughout the 20th century in the Catholic Church. And then, of course, there was the massive modernist coming out party that took place in the 1960s, which is why, to this day, Catholics are not allowed to quite even question the, the, the Great Council, Vatican II, which closed in 1965. It's like questioning vaccines on Facebook. It's the one thing you simply don't get to do. Francis just made a move to shut down the Latin Mass throughout the world. Why? Because he said it violates the spirit of unity. It violates the Second Vatican Council. Now, in these days, everybody's going to heaven. You see, even in the secular society, this idea of universal salvationism, you don't have to be a Christian, you don't really have to be anything, you can hug trees, you can be nice to kitty cats, you can be a Scientology, it doesn't matter. Even atheists are going to heaven, so says Francis, right? That's a radical revolution that happened in the Catholic Church, to go from Pius XII to Pope Francis. It's like a completely new religion now, much more concerned about the soup kitchen church, about climate change and things like that than they are about the, the issues of the soul, salvation of the soul, all those old ideas about dying and being judged and going up to either heaven or hell. The church has completely changed. The Vatican, in partnership with the United Kingdom and Italy, this year's presidents of the G7 and G20, is inviting faith leaders and scientists from around the world to Rome to discuss issues of climate change on October 4th. The meeting, titled Faith and Science Towards COP26, will be part of the build-up to the United Nations Climate Change Conference to take place in Glasgow this November 1st to 12th. In a meeting with the United States Special Climate Envoy John Kerry, Pope Francis expressed his interest in participating in the UN Climate Change Conference this fall. She stopped emphasizing the things of the soul. We don't talk about sin or hell or judgment, heaven and hell, death anymore. It doesn't happen, not even from the pulpit, with very rare and exceptional exceptions. I mean, do you remember a time when Francis recently warned the world that they, were, they better get back and repent, for example? It's kind of his job. Have you heard Francis telling the world they got to repent of things like abortion? They got to repent for having offended God. They have to repent for having destroyed Christian marriage because the end is coming and hell waits for those who don't repent. Have you heard this guy say anything about that? Of course not. Why not? Because there has been a revolution. And I'm getting to the Klaus Schwab connection here in a minute. It's fascinating, the connection. It's the same revolution. It's because 50 years ago, the modernists which are just globalists with theology degrees, in case anybody's wondering what these guys were. They, if you'll forgive me, they, they defunded the priests. You know, they did the same thing that's happening in a secular world, in the cities right now, was happening in the church a half century ago. They defunded the priests. They tore down all the statues, literally tore down the statues of saints and Blessed Mother and all this. They ripped out the communion rails. They got Catholics off of their knees, had them stand up, Received communion in the hand, not on the tongue. Anything that required the devotion or the faith, the simple faith of a child, was destroyed by these modernists. And then they turned a woke mob loose in the sanctuaries, in the seminaries, in the schools. It's no accident that the premier Catholic university in America awarded an honorary degree to the most pro-abortion president in history. And this, by the way, was never a movement of the people. It started at the top. Pope Paul VI, father of the new mass, reset the church in the image and likeness of democracy. He played his part brilliantly as the old king, setting aside the old ways of the old church. And for the sake of the poor, he even uncrowned himself. Now, stick with me. I realize a lot of people out here are not Catholics, or a lot of people are new to the whole, this whole idea of revolution in the Catholic Church. Stick with me, because this has to do with every single one of us, regardless of what religion we belong to. This is a world global domination that required the immoral authority of Christianity to get, I'm sorry, get the hell out of the way. What does this have to do with Klaus Schwab? And the connection, again, is amazing. But before we get to that, we have to talk about the bizarre middle-of-the-night ritual that took place beneath the streets of Rome way back in 1965. It was called the Catacombs Pact. 92-year-old Father Luigi Batazzi is the last known survivor of a secret pact that experts say may have influenced Pope Francis. 
signed 50 years ago at the time of Vatican II by Catholic bishops in this underground church in Rome. Called the Pact of the Catacombs, it vowed to create a poor church for the poor, the same church Pope Francis says he wants today. Yes, we have to go back on November 16th, 1965, and that evening, 40, around 40 father council, council uh, fathers, council yeah. father, yeah, gathered in uh, catacomb of Domitilla. Mm -hmm. Now his Italian accent is a little thick, so what he's talking about there when he mentions these council fathers, now these are the council fathers, these are the bishops of Vatican II, the most powerful, prestigious prelates in the church at the time going down into the catacombs of Rome at the close of the council. And they decide, for example, to decide uh, to refuse, for example, to be called uh, eminency, mm -hmm. monsignor, so they wanted to be called like father. Now, does that sound familiar? You know, we've seen this now with Francis in spades. He's no longer the vicar of Christ. He's no longer your holiness. He's not even pope anymore. The Francis now is just plain, simple, stripped down Francis. And we can say, for example, that uh, they decide to refuse all the insignia. Okay. And when I say insignia, it means uh, uh, like the no, yeah, the cross, the, the rings, yeah, not the yeah. This included obviously doing away with the papal tiara or the crown, the symbol of the Pope's ruling authority which has been there for a thousand years. From 1143, in fact, to 1963, the papal tiara was solemnly placed on the Pope's head during the papal coronation. Pope Paul VI was crowned Pope. He wasn't inaugurated. He was crowned. And they got rid of that institution of the monarchy at every level in the Catholic confessional states for the hundred years before that. And finally, they got rid of the idea of crowning the Pope. He no longer was a monarch. He was more like a president, which is exactly where they wanted it. So in 1964, Pope Paul VI renounces that crown, and the popes have never been crowned since. And after his mass, we're talking about Francis now, after his massive inauguration in 2013, he said that he wanted a poor church for the poor people. You remember this? Ah, come vorrei una chiesa povera, e per i poveri. Now, that, that, that advocacy, Francis' advocacy of the church of the poor, which he loves to talk about because it makes him look so virtuous, he's all about the poor, this is a direct reference now to the catacomb pact. And again, all week long, for the past two or three weeks, we keep hearing this, this mantra that the church is going to become the church of the poor, as though the church had no connection to the poor of the past as we've explained so many times and this is one of those things that you should just have like this at your fingertips when anybody brings this up that the church of vatican ii now cares about the poor just remind them that the catholic church invented the idea of hospitals invented the idea of orphanages and soup kitchens and schools all across the world for a couple thousand years she knew a little something about the poor so the only reason they're bringing this up is, an, is, is as an excuse to abandon the theology of the Catholic Church, to abandon the liturgy of the Catholic Church. And it just sounds so compassionate. We care about poor people. More than 2,000 years worth of priests, bishops, and popes cared about poor people. That's the game. Again, so transparent and so stupid that it makes you nauseous. But that's what they're trying to do. Francis then, he used the Amazon Synod of 2019. Now, this is, this is when the lights went out soon thereafter. The Amazon Synod was the last thing any of us remember before the world blew up with the whole COVID thing. He was so eager to put that thing on display, this weird thing that had happened back in 1965, that he has a special celebration of the catacombs packed. I was in Rome at the time, and I talked about it then. You might remember some of this. Now, tomorrow, again, just a few hours from now, this commemoration of the Catacomb Pact at the Amazon Synod, no less, will reinforce Francis's personal commitment you know, to, to enlist the church in the effort to establish a new social order, exactly as paragraph 10 of the Catacombs Pact, the original Catacombs Pact, vowed to do over 50 years ago. Quote, we will do our utmost 
so that those responsible for our government and for our public services make and put into practice laws, structures, and social institutions required by justice and charity, equality in the harmonic and holistic development of all men and women, and by this means, bring about the advent of another and new social order, end quote, also known as the New World Order, based not on the kingship of Christ, but again on the Freemasonic idea of the brotherhood of man. It's just, uh, it's, 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 I, I don't know what to make of this. Tomorrow's in the middle of all of this, of this chaos that's going on in the church and, and, and all the crises and the sex scandals and everything else. These guys are going to be commemorating this 50-year-old incident that happened at the close of the Second Vatican Council. And this commemoration is being organized by Archbishop Erwin Kreutler. Now, he's one of the official spokesmen of the Amazon Synod, and he was on the committee, actually, that wrote the instrument on the board. So he's a pretty important guy at the Synod. And after a press conference last week, I personally videotaped him admitting to Edward Penton that he's in favor of women priests. Check this out. Is the ordination of women deacons part of a push to ordain women priests in the church? I guess many of the bishops are in favor. Women now are able, not are able, to be ordained. Why? So you support women. You would like to see women si. ordained priests? Logically. So now, in just a few hours, tomorrow morning, this guy, in favor of women priests, he will head up a group of synod fathers at the commemoration mass at sunrise in Rome, down in the catacomb. The exact spot where the original catacomb pact took place some 54 years ago. What the Amazon Synod was actually doing was implementing the catacombs pact. I always say that Pope Francis is the new catacombs pact. In 2016, a day-long seminar in Rome took place, marking the anniversary of this catacomb pact. And according to the Washington Post, Cardinal Casper was on board, and he admitted that Pope Francis's program is, to a high degree, what the catacomb pact was all about. Okay, finally, I've teased it long enough. What does this have to do with Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum, Davos, and the Great Reset? Well, to answer that, we ask one more question. Who was the mastermind behind the catacombs pact the guy who led the council fathers of vatican II down under the streets of rome to declare war on the old church who was that our young italian friend in the video clip just named him around 40 mm -hmm. council fathers one of those was as i said helder camara mm -hmm. did you catch that we'll slow it down play it one more time helder camara mm -hmm. helder camara bishop helder camara or Camara, to anglicize it. He was born in 1909, he died 90 years later, an extremely influential person in South America and in the church in general. The self-identified socialist archbishop from Brazil, whom Francis would declare a servant of God in 2015. He's an advocate of liberation theology, of course. He's the bishop of the slums. <laughs> Starting to sound familiar? Well, it should. He is the role model of one Jorge Mario Bergoglio. He attended all four sessions of the Second Vatican Council and even played a significant role in drafting Gaudium et Spes, one of the 16 document documents of Vatican II, on the pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world, which now, according to Monsignor Gherardini, professor of the ecclesiology at the Pontifical Lateran University, makes the church one speak one speaker among many others, and robs her of the nature of Sacramentum Christi and of her subsequent responsibility concerning eternal salvation. <laughs> or put another way, it's a document that helped rob the church of her point and purpose and set her up as the church of the soup kitchen, we might say, the church of the poor, and ultimately the advocate of a world without borders the modern church as we see it today. And yes, it was Archbishop Camara, who on November 16th, 1965, led 42 powerful council fathers, bishops, down into the catacombs to sign the catacombs pact. There's a bit more on that. Now they also vowed to put pressure on international organizations to help change the economic structures which they said exploit the poor. These are all points that are remarkably similar to Pope Francis's agenda for the church today. 
Francis hit the ground running with the catacombs packed. Deviene il applauso consueto perché è, è stato eletto il Papa. E lui mi abbracciò, mi baciò e mi ha detto non ti dimentichi dei poveri. E quella parola, parola è entrata qui. I poveri, i poveri. I was there, I was in Rome, I was in the Vatican when this happened. I was in the Paul VI audience hall that very day. Francis was rolling out the catacombs packed right before our eyes. And this was, of course, the brainchild of a socialist archbishop with Marxist sympathies who didn't believe that we should obsess over things like contraception, by the way, either. Archbishop Kamara criticized, in fact, Pope Paul VI's removal of artificial contraception from the purview of the Second Vatican Council, calling the prohibition of contraception a, quote, mistake meant to torture spouses and to disturb peace of many homes, so says Kamara. Now, do you understand why it is that after Francis got in, whose mentor was this clown, Kamara, well, after Francis, everything there was just no stopping anybody. Even Jeffrey Sh Sachs then becomes a celebrity guest speaker in the Vatican, even though he's a huge proponent of contraception and population control. So the world is uh, getting very crowded, and the big problem is that in the poorest countries, uh, families are still having six, seven, or eight children. That's what's putting this uh, tremendous growth in population. Well, I think the main thing is that uh, when women in poor countries have better choice, they're better informed, they have education, they choose to have fewer children. Uh, they choose to adopt family planning or contraception. Is all beginning to make sense? And so you're asking, understandably, what's the connection to Klaus Schwab? Finally, come on. Well, here it is. Archbishop Kamara, Council Father, one of the authors of Gaudium et Spes, revolutionary personality who's responsible for the catacombs pact. He's got one more point on his resume. <laughs> he was a major influence on a young Klaus Schwab. I, I give you one example, which for me was probably a crucial moment in my life. I traveled for the first time uh, to Brazil. I met a priest uh, who was known at that time as the priest of the poor people. Hmm. Uh, his name was Don Elder Camara. And he brought me to the favelas of uh, Recife and I was so shocked. And I said, I have to invite this bishop to Davos, mm. to tell the people what poverty is. So I invited him to, to, to the annual meeting in Davos, but some when I came back in Switzerland, I found out that actually he was forbidden at that time Ooh. to speak in Switzerland because he was considered to be a communist. And I said, this is for me a test. But then I noticed that many companies told me, if you invite this person, who is so much against business, we will not come to Davos anymore. And that's where I had to stand to my values. Yeah. Even at the risk that I would have to give up uh, the World Economic Forum. Wow. Um, but it went very well. Uh, I have to say, um, the audience in Davos listened to him. So what we're talking about here is one of the council fathers and a speaker at Davos. The guys who are setting up the World Economic Forum, the Great Reset, and the New World Order. He was one of them, ladies and gentlemen. Now, they also vowed to put pressure on international organizations to help change the economic structures which they said exploit the poor. These are all points that are remarkably similar to Pope Francis's agenda for the church today. It's the same revolution. It's the same players, in fact. The Great Reset was indeed hatched in a catacomb beneath the streets of Rome at the close of the Second Vatican Council in 1965. And it just took a while to get to the point politically where it is now. But it's the same movement. I met a priest uh, who was known at that time as the priest of the poor people. Hmm. Uh, his name was Don Elder Camara. One of the most profound moments in the life of Klaus Schwab, 
was his meeting with, <laughs> with the leader of the catacombs pact celebrated in Rome, not only at the time, but during the Amazon Synod in 2019, when, by the way, the pagan idols of Pachamama were processed into the holiest place in Christendom, the holiest place of pilgrimage in Christendom, St. Peter's Basilica. The abomination of desolation was set up at that moment. And a few months, a few months later, all the churches in the world would be locked down and lock their doors. <laughs> and we still haven't recovered from that. Now, once we realize what these connections mean, once we realize that there really is no separation of church and state, <laughs> that the global super state needed to sort of take the Catholic Church, the moral authority of the church, over, infiltrate the church in order to make this happen. Once we realize how long they've been working on this and what it all means, it actually becomes a lot easier to do what we need to do. Just, we get to see what's going on, and it becomes easy to recognize our duty as faithful Christians. We have no choice, friends. I've been saying this for a long time, but I hope this connection helps us all see it. We have no choice but to resist these infiltrators. We need to spread the word. Vatican II, the Great Reset, the Novus Ordo, which means new order. <laughs> new world order in the church, new world order in the world. It's the same. They had to get rid of Christ the King. They had to get rid of the traditional teachings of the church on marriage and abortion and contraception. You see, it's all connected. It's all part of the same exact revolution against the kingship of Jesus Christ. Do you see why? <laughs> why we're talking about proclaiming that kingship? Because that is the answer to everything that's going on in the church, in the state, in the reset, in the new world order, with COVID, with forced vaccinations, all of it. All of it. Bring the king back to fight this war. You see why Francis was chosen to replace Benedict? Whatever happened to Benedict? What was that all about? The guy that brought back the traditional Latin mass gets kicked out. He gets replaced by a South American Jesuit hippie Pope Bergoglio. And one of the first things he does is bring the catacombs pack back. And now he's trying to outlaw the traditional Latin mass that Benedict brought into the church. Brought back to the church, I should say. Why, are you confused about what's going on here? This is why Francis is a champion of the New World Order. He's a champion of climate change, the climate change religion, more than he is a champion of the Catholic religion, which he is burying every day. You see? It should be so clear now. It was all done. This whole thing was done through trickery, through treachery, and under the cover of night, oftentimes. The people weren't consulted. You weren't consulted. I wasn't consulted about any of this. In that video I just showed you, when I keep saying, I keep saying we can beat these people, the main thing is to raise awareness. Wake up. Let people know what's going on. They're not invincible. In that video I just showed you of Klaus Schwab, well, it comes from the World Economic Forum's Mighty Global Shapers YouTube channel. Guess how many subscribers are on that YouTube channel? 2,000. <laughs> 2,000. It's probably mostly just the mothers and friends of the folks that speak at Davos. That's about it. 2,000. Now, little RTV, Remnant TV, little Remnant TV, you know how many subscribers we have by comparison to give you some idea of why I think we need to fight? We have 250,000 subscribers, and we're just a small little group putting videos out, a little newspaper. That video that, that, that I just showed you, it was uploaded back in June. Today, it has a whopping 39 likes and more important, 260 dislikes from the World Economic Forum. You see the point? It's got 4,000 views, 108 comments. Nearly all of them are negative. Most of them are hilarious, making fun of these crazy old men who for a half century have been taking themselves way too seriously, friends. They still haven't won over the hearts of the people, and they never will. So when we talk about family, God, patriotism, country, we know those things win over the hearts of millions. That's where our confidence comes from, that we can beat these crazy Yahoo Bond villain nutjobs at Davos, the lunatics of Davos. 
Bill Gates, their spiritual Sven Gali, he can't even show his face in public these days, Kenny. Anthony Fauci is a laughing stock. Klaus Schwab, oh my gosh, your Mars, reimagine your Mars. He's a punchline. Straight from central casting, he's a joke. And Francis, oh my gosh. I really don't even know if this man showers. The great white hope, Francis. <laughs> he had one simple job to do. That's why he was installed. That's why he replaced Ben. One job to do. He had to hand the Catholic Church, what was left of the Catholic Church, hand it over to the lunatics of Davos, to the globals. Right? That's all he had to do. And you know what? He blew it. He failed. He did a face plan. Look at him. Instead of, instead of doing that, pulling that off, he's actually done what I didn't think was even possible. He's united the Catholics of the world against these lunatics, against the globalists. Raymond Arroyo, Michael Matt, George Weigel, bishops of the world, traditional Catholics, neo -Catholic, former neo-Catholics, faithful Catholics, millions and millions of us now united against what's going on. Way to go, Francis. I think maybe they picked the wrong guy. <laughs> it's no wonder the bishops in this country are changing. The winds of change are coming in to the episcopacy. The bishops of South Dakota just released a really good statement providing formal religious exemption against forced, forced vaccination. Do you know why? Because they can see what's coming. And they know Francis is not on their side. Francis cannot be trusted with your children, with, your li with the lives of your children, even much less their souls. It's no wonder then that the Colorado bishops just yesterday released their own religious exemption letter template stating that they continue to support religious exemptions from any and all vaccine mandates. You see what's happening? This is bad news for the lunatics of Davos. Most bishops in this country, apart from Dolan and Supich, who are toadies of Pope Francis, they agree with us and they agree with Ron DeSantis, and they agree with guys like the Missouri Attorney General Eric Schmidt. This is America, the freest country in the history of the world. Uh, people can make their decisions. I believe in freedom. I believe in responsibility. But people can make these um, very important decisions themselves. And I don't want to live in some futuristic, dystopian, biomedical security state. And I'm going to do everything I can as Attorney General to protect the rights of individuals in the state. Exactly right. And by the way, this attorney general, he's vaccinated. That's not the point. He's talking about the tyranny that's coming with forced vaccinations, and he's absolutely right. Let's close this show with another plea not to let the media get in your heads. Do not buy what they're telling you, that you're alone, that you can't fight back, that this is an absolutely impossible boulder that we're pushing up the hill. Because this global medical technocracy is a joke. Nobody wants it. I don't care how much of Gates' money they have, how many billions of dollars they, they've got. You know what they don't have? They do not have support. They do not have the support of the people. They have not won the people over. Millions upon millions are opposing this medical technocracy. It's not a slam dunk. I'm not a doctor. I don't know anything about virology. I do know something about politics. I know something about tyranny. And forced vaccinations is tyrannical. A forced vaccination passport is the stuff of Nazism and Stalinism. And we must oppose it with everything that we have. If it fails here, it will fail globally. And that's what they're worried about. And that main instrument of global control of all of us will be lost to them. <laughs> Bottom line. Don't give up. Keep fighting. You know, call your bishops. There's a lot of good bishops who are waking up right now. Call them, support them, pray for them. Call your political representatives. Let them know where you stand. Stand up. Fight back. Watch the amazing things that can and will happen, friends, when pro God, pro family, and pro country clans, people like us, when we unite together against the whacked out, sorry old hippies of globalist tyranny trying to dominate the world right now, like the lunatics that they are. When we unite against them, great things are gonna happen. They're gonna fail, especially, God help us, if we wake up. So let's wake up, let's go out into the street, and let's win this war. I know we can do it, and we're gonna do it. We're doing it right now. I'm Michael Matt for Remnant TV Friends. Thank you so much for listening. Keep the faith, stay strong, and we'll see you next week.